This is the story of Atlas Jet Flight 4203. On the 30th of November 2007, an Atlas Jet MD-83 was on the ground at Istanbul's Atatürk Airport, bound for Isparta Airport. The flight had 50 passengers and 7 crew members on board. The MD-83 that they were flying that day had only been inducted into the Atlas Jet fleet just 5 months ago, and it had been manufactured in 1994. The plane had served with a whole host of operators from the likes of Reno Air, American Airlines, Turkish carrier Freebird Airlines, and Turkish Airlines. The flight's first officer was new to the flight deck of the MD-83. He was part of the Turkish Air Force, but as of the 20th of November, he had only accumulated 14 hours on the MD-83, well below the 100 needed by Turkish regulators. At 12.51 a.m., the plane took off from Istanbul's Atatürk Airport. As the plane climbed into the inky black sky, the pilots put the plane on course for Isparta. The flight was expected to take an hour and 25 minutes, so I don't think anyone on board really had time to get comfortable. Soon they were in contact with the controllers at Isparta. Now, Isparta isn't a big airport, so it did not have the facilities that larger airports might have, like an ILS or instrument landing system, which guides planes right down to the runway. Instead, the pilots had to use radio beacons known as VORs to navigate to the airport. Once the pilots were over the VOR at Isparta, they then had to let the controller know when they were turning inbound towards the runway. After the plane overflew the airport, it headed away from the runway to line up with the runway. After a few minutes, the controller got confirmation that the pilots were turning inbound towards the runway. They were 18 kilometers or 11 miles away from the airport. At the rate things were going, flight 4203 should be on the ground in mere minutes. But the controller did not hear back from flight 4203. The landing time for flight 4203 came and went. There was no plane. The controller was trying to race the plane on radio, but no reply came through. The controller got in touch with other planes in the area to try and get them to spot the missing MD-83. But that did not work as well. The night was just too dark. Immediately, search and rescue teams were sent out into the night to try and find the missing plane. But the darkness and the mountainous terrain made things very difficult. The Turkish Air Force even sent out a helicopter equipped with a thermal camera to try and find the missing jet. At 6 a.m., the helicopter came upon the crash site of Flight 4203. None of the 57 people on board survived. As with all crashes, the discovery of the wreck was immediately followed up by a barrage of news interviews. But the really weird thing about this crash was the statement made by the CEO of Atlas Jet right after the crash. In his press conference, he said, quote, The accident was caused by pilot error. There was no technical fault with the aircraft. End quote. Is it just me, or does that seem a bit weird? Like, no one knows the reason for the crash hours after the wreck has been found. And here's the CEO throwing the pilots under the bus. To find out the actual reason for the crash, four investigators were sent to the crash site. The crash site was spread over a relatively large area of 5,000 square meters or 54,000 square feet. They examined the wreck and the engine seemed to be working and the plane was configured correctly. But the very interesting thing and the investigator's first clue was the location of the crash itself. The crash site was located 12 kilometers or 7.5 miles to the west of the airport. The approach to runway 05 did not need the plane to be in the mountainous area that it was. Flight 4203 had been sent off course in its last moments and they needed to find out why. In any accident, the biggest source of information is the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder. Those two sources more often than not paint a very accurate picture of what happened in the cockpit of the plane. Modern flight data recorders record a multitude of parameters. The flight data recorders of Flight 4203 were sent to Germany to be downloaded. But unfortunately, the investigators found out that the voice recorder had not been functioning for the past nine days. And weirdly enough, the data recorder only recorded the first 14 minutes of the flight, and then it stopped working. So, the investigators had to start looking at the things that they had. The flight path, the history of the plane, and things like that. The history of the plane gave them something interesting. 
The EGPWS, or the Enhanced Ground Proximity Warning System that was installed on Flight 4203, had been faulty for a very long time. The EGPWS is very important as it's the system that warns pilots if they're headed for terrain. If the system thinks that you're too close to a mountain or any sort of terrain, it will ask you to pull up. In most cases, the early warning provided by the EGPWS is enough for the pilots to save the plane. The memory unit on the EGPWS recovered from the crash site showed 86 faults over the course of 235 flights. That is a staggering amount of faults. What's even more scary is that all of this was intentionally hidden. The company that owned the plane prevented this failure from being written up. This way, there was no paper trail. So they knowingly put a broken plane into service. Most people working on the plane knew that the EGPWS was broken, but they kept putting the plane back into the sky. Which is absolutely nuts when you consider that Esparta Airport is nestled between high terrain and did not have ILS to get down to the runway. That wasn't the only rule that was broken. Remember the cockpit voice recorder and how that was broken? Well, apparently, the rule stated that if the cockpit voice recorder or the flight data recorder failed, then they had to fix the broken recorder within three days or the plane had to be grounded. This failure, too, was not documented. At this point, they've got to be avoiding a paper trail to hide their failures from regulators, right? This secrecy, unfortunately, in part cost 57 people their lives. But that does not explain the accident. Why were the pilots so far away from the airport in the first place? The investigators found out that the pilots were flying this approach manually. Now, you could program the approach into the flight management system, and the plane would fly the approach for you through the hills based on the data you've inputted. The FMS was also functional, so why didn't the pilots just use it? Well, the data was never uploaded to the FMS, and the pilots had to fly the approach manually, adding another layer of complexity to an already difficult approach. Since the investigators did not have access to the flight data for the flight, they turned their attention to the radar track for the plane. The plane was supposed to fly a heading of 223 degrees away from the runway, and then they had to turn right to line up with runway 05. But the pilots apparently made a small mistake. They were off by 30 degrees. Instead of flying 223 degrees away from the airport, they flew a heading of 253 degrees. Flying a heading of 223 degrees would have kept them safe from the mountains, and it would have taken them right down the valley. But flying 253 degrees took them right into the midst of the mountains. Had the EGPWS system been working, it would have provided the pilots with enough warning to save their plane. Even without the EGPWS, it looked like the pilots knew that something was wrong in the last few moments of the flight, as they found the attitude indicator in the wreck showing that the pilots were attempting to climb. In addition to that, the plane impacted the mountain tail first, which is more proof that the pilots attempted to climb in the last few moments of flight. But unfortunately, they just weren't able to clear the mountain in front of them. To understand more about this crash, the investigators looked into the pilots themselves, how they were trained, all that sort of stuff. They found that the airline lacked documentation for a lot of simulator training for the pilots. For example, they had no record of CRM, CFIT, GPWS simulator training. They also found that the captain only received 20 hours of simulator training, as opposed to the required 32 hours of simulator training. Things were not too much better for the first officer. The company had said that the first officer got 32 hours of simulator training but that could not be proven with documents. Both of these pilots had very little experience on the MD-83, and on top of that, they were not experienced with the challenging approach to Isparta. It seems that the 30-degree error that the pilots made was just because they did not know the airport well enough, and they were too overwhelmed with what was happening around them, and that allowed mistakes to creep in. This accident is the result of the perfect confluence of mistakes, the early warning system had been disabled due to a fault that had not been fixed. The pilots were new to the MD-83 and did not have much experience on the type. The flight management system had not been programmed with the approach to Isparta, 
meaning that the pilots had to fly the approach manually. And the pilots weren't familiar with the airport, which led them to make a 30-degree error, which took them right into the midst of very tall mountains that they were not supposed to be in. In your opinion, can this crash even be called pilot error? The airline messed up so badly on this one. Their attempts to hide the failure of the EGPWS on a plane that frequently goes to airports in mountainous terrain is just unacceptable. This airline had no issue skirting the loss as we see from the cockpit voice recorder fiasco. Due to all of this, a lawsuit into the crash was started in December of 2009. In the end, the owner of World Focus Airlines, the company from which Atlas Jet leased the MD-83, was found guilty of letting an unfit aircraft fly. The CEO and chief technical officers were also found guilty. They were all sentenced to 11 years and 8 months in prison. The maintenance chief of World Focus Airlines was sentenced to 5 years in prison for his involvement in the crash. That wraps up the story of Atlas Jet Flight 4203. If you want to watch another video about a plane that accidentally flew into a mountain, then I highly recommend my video on West Coast Airlines Flight 956. Link on your screen right now. Thank you for watching this episode of Mini Air Crash Investigation. If you like the videos that I make, do consider liking and subscribing. It will really help the channel grow. I will catch you guys next time. Stay safe.